Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another class of uh, Lifestyle Evangelism. Let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us please lead us in prayer? Father, we thank you for this time you have given us. Lord, we pray even as we come before your presence to learn from your word. We pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us all to reveal the mysteries of your word and help us to understand and live out of the relation that we understand from you, God. We thank you for this time in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Uh, okay, uh, so let's just continue from where we picked up uh, last week. So last week we looked at chapter 6, looked at how we can invite and pray pray for people. Uh, we looked at the, uh, you know, the importance or the power of a single invitation uh, and how, uh, you know, uh, Andrew went and found his brother and then through common interest, uh, they both came to know the Messiah. And, and, and so as we are learning all of this, uh, you know, I, I just pray and, uh, you know, that's my heart's desire is that we apply this uh, in our lives where, wherever we get opportunities to yeah, you know, to share the gospel, to do so. Uh, and then we also looked at uh, certain hindrances or some certain things that hold us back from inviting uh, people to explore Jesus. And uh, there were a few points. We are too self-conscious at times. Uh, we are afraid uh, to face rejection. Uh, we are afraid that people may perceive us differently. So we also looked at last week and how we should not compartmentalize our life, which means who we are on Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, is who we should be on Sunday as well, right? So we're not two different people. Uh, so just be yourself. Uh, then we looked at uh, you know another point where we're afraid that we don't know all the answers. So if they, what if they ask difficult questions? And also, sometimes we're afraid to invite them to church because the church service may not be even relevant to them. And uh, we had you know looked at a few examples of through all of this three important things that we uh, also looked at was while you're making an invitation to a friend or somebody uh, who is an unbeliever be simple be truthful uh, be inviting without coercing which means don't don't force them right uh, you know, don't say hey, i know you for 10 years you have to come now no. right uh, be simple be truthful and just invite them, let them make the decision whether they should come or not. All right, so before we get into chapter seven, uh, I'm gonna ask the question, did anyone get an opportunity to share the gospel? Any one of us, uh, whether it was in the mall or the supermarket, neighbor, anybody? Even if it was just a point of, you know, uh, pointing them to what Jesus did in your life, if, even if it was just for one minute, uh, that's a seed sown. Uh, did any one of you try? Yes, go ahead, Nicholson. Yes. Um, so we had, uh, we were just heading back from church. We are currently in house churches. So we are visiting okay. one house church and we are heading back. And on the way, there was this kid just standing on the road who looked at us like, you know, please pick me up kind of look he had on his face. So we passed him, then we stopped and we said, okay, let's just ask him if he wants to come. He came on board and by God's grace, through that entire journey, we started talking and we were able to share the gospel. So um, it started off simple. It started off with just him saying, uh, I mean, he's a Hindu uh, person. So they had their Ganesha festival recently. And we just said we went to church. So he said, oh, why do you go to church? And then it started from there. And we were able to share. And uh, we gave him our number. So we are hoping that he'd reach out to us. We told, invited him for our youth meeting. So we are hoping he gets back to us soon. Yeah, that's that's nice. Thank you, Nicholson. Yes, that's nice. Uh, so the good thing was, you know, uh, what Nicholson did was he gave his contact number. So, you know, uh, can always be in touch with that person. So uh, that's nice. Anybody else uh, uh, got an opportunity to share the gospel or just invite somebody to church as well? Even that's fine. Yes, Lubega, go ahead. 
praise the Lord, Pastor. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I'm working at an institution as a consultant, and uh, the owner is a Christian, but uh, he always says that his institution is not affiliated to any religion. So this week, I had a chance to be training them, uh, starting from Monday. And uh, yesterday, he has been part of the training. And yesterday, as we were concluding the session, he, he had to say something. When I was training them, I showed them that uh, as far as spiritual development is concerned, I showed to them that we came from where we don't know and we will go where we don't know. So our life does not basically depend on us because we were not asked to come here and they won't ask us when we're going. So I try to show them in the Bible, teach them some things to do with the Bible. And to yesterday when he was talking, it was his first time to, to tell everybody in, in the congregation that his institution is Christian best and we are all laughing we are saying how comes that this man is saying that his institution is a christian based so i think it is a step in the right direction as we try to preach the gospel of jesus christ thank you pastor thank you lubega that's thank, nice. thank you lubega that's nice that's good okay anybody else oh. anybody else would like to share Okay. All right. So that's great. Um, I want to encourage you, uh, each one of us, uh, go ahead and, you know, uh, try your best, right? You may have to step out of your comfort zone. Uh, I understand that, you know, uh, many of us may be, uh, you know, with COVID happening, restrictions around. Uh, but if we do get an opportunity, uh, let's, you know, uh, put this into practice. Right? Um, no matter what uh, the Bible teaches us, be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word, right? Uh, not only uh, our subject, uh, lifestyle evangelism, but as you go through this entire course, uh, you know, the point is, yes, we get knowledge, we want to learn, um, uh, but we need to apply that into our life, right? If we, for example, we're learning about prayer, and we know, okay, these are different kinds of prayer, uh, or this is the different kinds of worship that we can do. But if we don't apply it, what happens is it just becomes head knowledge. And we don't want that. We want to grow in the Lord. So that's the whole point of uh, learning, right? Okay, let's go to chapter seven. Chapter seven, connect and impact. Uh, now we will look at uh, John chapter four, the whole encounter with the Samaritan woman that Jesus had. And we'll pick up a few examples from them. Now, the reason we're using this again is because it, it teaches us a lot. It teaches us, uh, you know, how we can evangelize. And it's the best example that we can find throughout the scriptures. Of course, later on, we look at chapter eight. We look at how Apostle Paul went into Asia Minor, went into Corinth, Ephesus, and he did a wonderful work there. So we will look at that as well. So this week, we will look at the Samaritan encounter with Jesus. Now, we all know the story, right? Uh, from Jerusalem to Galilee, through Samaria was about a three days journey. So Jesus and his disciples decided, okay, we're going to go to uh, 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 Samaria and we're going to pass uh, through a city called Sichar, right? And this uh, city is uh, uh, in the district of Samaria. Now, Jesus took his disciples and wanted to go to Samaria. Now, here's the interesting thing. When we read it, we may feel, okay, so what's what's the what's the big deal about, you know, okay, Jesus wanting to go to Samaria? Now, let me just do a little bit of a background, right? We may have heard this, but this is important to understand. The Jews in the Old Testament, the Jews started getting married to the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were idol worshippers, right? They... They had a mountain called Mount Gerizim, which moved on to different kinds of mountains, and they had temples in different places. And so the Samaritans were Gentile worshippers. And the Jews began to get, you know, married to the Samaritans, right? So sometimes it would be a Jewish husband and a Samaritan woman, or a Samarit Jewish woman and a Samaritan uh, husband. So 
they intermarried, right? So what they would do is the Samaritans, uh, they would go to this temple and they would worship the idol, but they would also follow the law, right? Because, you know, they were half and half. So they would also say, okay, uh, God of Yahweh, uh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we also believe that. We also fought, try to follow the law. Uh, so it was a mixed culture. Now, this is something that was extremely offensive to the Jews. Because they said, you are Gentiles, and you got married to Jews. And not only did you do a wrong thing by getting intermarried, now you are also worshipping you know, the, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the only true God. And so they utterly despised the Samaritans. You know, history says that if they wanted to use a curse word, uh, they would say, hey, you Samaritan. It was like the highest uh, form of curse word for a Jew. Hey, don't be a Samaritan. It was like the highest form of a curse word, right? And, and so now Jesus is taking these disciples who are strong Jewish people and saying, let's go to Samaria. Now, you know, the mindset would have been Jesus why Samaria? Usually, if you look at the map, it's Jerusalem and, and then there's Samaria. It's just on one, you know, one straight line. But what the Jews would do is they would take a roundabout and then go this way because they, they had this uh, you know, feeling that they didn't even want to breathe the air that the Samaritans breathed. So there was so much of division and hatred. Now, with that as a backdrop, Jesus is telling his disciples, let's go to Samaria. And disciples may be wondering why. Why Samaria? Out of all the places, why that place? That terrible place. The people are bad. The, the place is bad. But Jesus takes his disciples. Jesus goes in and as he enters uh, this, this city of Sichar, Jesus is tired. He sat at Jacob's well, and this was about the sixth hour, which is about 12 in the afternoon. Very hot, right? And he sat near this well. He met the Samaritan woman, and there was a divine setup. It was not pre-planned. It was not scheduled. It wasn't even expected. Jesus did not, uh, you know, uh, uh, pre-plan it. Okay, you come there. I'll meet you there. No, it was not pre-planned. So Jesus is there. There's a Samaritan woman. And we know that Jesus began to minister to her and you know, uh, bring the whole message of the Messiah, that he being the Messiah. So point number one, be open for divine setups. Even as we go through this walk of life, we will have divine setups that will come our way. Things that we may not have, you know, thought or planned about, right? Uh, for example, maybe you go to your friend's house. And when you go to your friend's house, you see an old friend who was in school, you know, 15 years back. Say, hey, I remember you. Now, this could be a divine setup. You know, you had planned to meet another friend of yours, but then you meet a school friend who was a friend maybe 15 years back. Be open for divine setups. That could be an opportunity for you to get to know, you know, what he's doing and then slowly present the gospel to him, right? Be open for setups which God has arranged and be open to share the gospel with that person. You know, Nicholson was sharing, right? Uh, there was just a random kid that was on the road uh, and it was, a, it was a divine setup, right? They didn't plan, okay, we'll go on the road, we will stand on the road, we will wait. It was not a plan. They were just finished church going back home. And so the same way, each one of us, God will open and give us divine encounters, divine setups, right? But here's the important thing. We must recognize those divine encounters. Right? We must recognize it. Hey, this is divine. This is something that God has, you know, set in place. I need to do this, right? Uh, or if we don't recognize it, or we, if we are not led by the Holy Spirit at that moment, 
then what happens is we will just look at it as a luck or a, just a instance that happened. Uh, you know, uh, but it's not. It's a divine setup, right? So we need to be open to those. Second one, we looked at the previous chapter, some of the inhibitions that stop us from sharing the gospel, right? Sometimes we are uh, we are not ready, or we feel that we don't know how to speak, or we don't have the answers, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of persecution. So me, uh, you know, uh, being an introvert. Uh, so all these are inhibitions that we have. But here in this example, Jesus had many reasons why he could have held back from sharing the gospel. And many reasons. Right? Uh, first one, he was tired. Right? Uh, all of us, you know, when we are tired, what do we want? We want some peace of mind. Right? I'm sure if you had a long, hard day's work, none of us will want a, you know, a, I mean, I don't know, but at least for me, I would want some peace of mind, some relaxing music, peace of mind. Right? I wouldn't want like, you know, screaming and shouting everywhere. Is it tired? You just want some peace. Now, Jesus is tired. They walked all the way, right? Uh, probably walked almost the whole day to enter that city. And he's tired. He could have said, okay, oh, by the time I, you know, talk to this lady, let me just, you know, let me just, just take water and be done with it. Uh, it was... You know, something that was happening inside him. He was tired, physically tired. But he pushed past that inhibition. So here's an important point, right? During our ministry, in our life, as we go about doing things, we will be tired uh, uh, as youth. And then when we get married, we have children. It's going to be tiresome, right? Uh, nothing is easy. You know, sometimes... You know, attending these three hours, one after the other, may be tiresome, right? But we push past our inhibitions. We push past those to make sure that we are able to do something and share the gospel with somebody else. Jesus did that. Two, he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan, right? What if that other person, the woman was a, Samar was a Jew? Well, okay, it's all right. Two Jews talking, no problem. Just go ahead, ask for water, be done with it. But that's a Samaritan. And that's why in the beginning of the class, I, you know, I put forth the whole thing of the difference between a Jew and a Samaritan and how the Jews despise the Samaritan. So that's a Samaritan. Oh, I don't want to talk to her. Uh, these are people who, you know, that too is Jesus. So being the son of God, he said, these are the people who have gone against the law, against God the Father, against my father, then they are not going to believe in me. They are not going to believe in the Messiah. So many thoughts can come to our mind. But Jesus pushed past that. He didn't let that cultural difference, that religious difference, get in the way of sharing the gospel. Right? Very important point. Sometimes we judge a person just by their culture, or their religion, or the things that they do, or the things they wear, or how they speak. We need to come out of that, right? We need to come out of that. Even though uh, the Jews hated the Samaritans, Jesus didn't bother about all of that. He said, no, I will you know, uh, speak to this woman. I will reveal myself to her. Third point, he was a man and this was a lady at the well, right? Now picture this. First of all, you're a Samaritan. Secondly, you're a Samaritan woman. Now it is said that the woman would come out in the afternoon time to do their most of their chores, their daily works. Why? Because uh, people would ridicule and mock at them. Women were not given high regard. Even through the Old Testament, not, not given high regard. And so it was like, not enough, you are a Samaritan, and you are a Samaritan woman. It's, you know, I shouldn't even be asking for water. I would rather you finish up filling your water and go away, and then I would find a way to, you know, fill my own water. 
again, Jesus pushed past that inhibition. Right? He pushed past all of this, his tiredness, the cultural, the gender differences. He pushed past all of that. What if people see me talking to this uh, Samaritan woman? What if the, you know, later on in that chapter, when the disciples came, the disciples were surprised to see Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. But they were afraid and they didn't ask him any question. Right? Jesus laid aside inhibitions to speak to her. How much more you and I need to lay aside inhibitions to present the gospel to other people. Right? Jesus explains his motivation. Why, why did he break past these inhibitions? He, in that same chapter, he says that. Let's look at a few points. He says, he lived to do the will of the Father, that is to complete and carry out his work. Right? So the main purpose of Jesus' life was not to raise 12 disciples and uh, have a big organization. Right? Uh, it, it, that was not the uh, will of God. The will, the plan of Jesus was to follow, obey the will of the Father. That's all. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew his time was up. What does he say? He says, let not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Let not my will, but your will be done. So the, the whole point of Jesus, you know, coming and... Uh, the, the coming into this world, the sacrifice that he died on the cross was to fulfill the will of the Father. He wanted to carry out his work. Let's read John chapter 4 and verse 34. Can one of us please read that? John 4 and 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Yeah, thank you, Rosalind. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said to them, my will is to fulfill all that he has sent me for and to do his work. Uh, the will of the Father is that each and every person be saved and come to know the truth. So it, in, in the natural it was like, okay, she's a Samaritan, she's a woman, she's, we have got differences. But for Jesus, his, his intentions or his purpose was not to look at these differences that was man-made, but to fulfill the will of the Father. Now, the moment we think of this, we will be able to pass, you know, pass in inhibitions and to overcome these inhibitions in our life. Like the woman think, hey, God has called me to fulfill his purpose in my life. So whether they are Hindu, whether they are Muslim, whether they are Sikh, whoever they are, whatever cultural differences, whatever backgrounds they are from, whether they are rich, whether they are poor, all of these natural things should not hinder us because we have come to fulfill the will of the Father. Right? So... When, once we have that in our mind, it does not become uh, an inhibition in our ministry. Two, every person is harvestable, ready to be reached. Right? John 4 and verse 35. Let's read verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Amen. Yes, thank you, Rosalind. So here what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples is the harvest time is ready. It's time for us to go and bring out the harvest. Every person is harvestable. And we looked at it in chapter one. Every person in this world, whether they you know, believe in God or they don't believe in God, have this place in their heart, a God-shaped vacuum, which only God can fill. Right? We gave so many examples of the rich and the influential people in the world who got everything 
that the uh, you know the desires of the world they, they they fulfilled all their desires yet they were empty why because they need god every person in this world is harvestable so so you and i uh, wherever we get opportunities remember that hey this person is harvestable i can share the gospel with him now whether they receive it whether they accept it or not that is secondary right uh, but i can share the gospel this person can reap a harvest in her life or his life right point number 3 we are gathering fruit for eternal life so eternity is at stake right uh, we rejoice together in the future even as we uh, do this remember the fruit uh, even evangelism as we sharing as we bring people to christ the fruit is not a temporary fruit paul is writing to timothy his last letter and he's telling timothy timothy you are you and the believers are the fruit you are my crown not a perishable crown which is which gets decayed and uh, gets wasted away but you are an imperishable crown in the presence of the lord apostle paul had many things to boast about right he could have said god uh, he would have gone to jesus and he said you know the number of missionary journeys i did and all this but he says no you are my crown you are my rejoicing you are the fruit of our ministry he writes that to the colossians he says the the uh, the the work of our ministry the fruit of our labor is you it's it's not it's not the uh, number of missionary journeys but you the people the believers the church that is the fruit of our labor and so remember that what we are doing is we are you know harvesting fruit for an eternal life right it's not a temporary fruit it's not something that is temporary it is eternal when we bring someone to christ and maybe they accept jesus and they're following and obeying god and walking in the word you and i have eternal fruit right it's not a temporary fruit what a joy it is that we are able to bring eternal fruit in the lives of people just by sharing the simple gospel right jesus knew it i may not see this woman again right uh i may not see her because i'm going to move on from here and this is my opportunity she, she jesus shared the gospel and she ex accepted that and through her the entire almost the entire city was touched by the gospel everyone believed later on it says that not only for what you said but also right for what we have heard and seen we believe that he is the messiah eternal fruit right fourth point sometimes we sow and others reap or sometimes others sow and we reap right now it is obvious now when you look at this woman she asked a lot of questions the samaritan woman she says uh, we know that one day the messiah is going to come you know when we worship in the mountain uh uh there'll come a time that you know we we worship on the mount there'll come a time when we will worship in the temple as well so she's trying to ask these questions because she already somebody has already put the seed in her heart what was the seed the messiah is there we are waiting for the messiah the messiah will come and get things done all that is you know uh, happening now uh, he will make things right so somebody has sown that seed in her and so when jesus uh when the samaritan woman meets jesus and says i know that the messiah is coming uh, is is going to come but what does jesus say it is i you have seen the one who you're seeing is the messiah right and then she begins to worship god and here's the important point here somebody else sows somebody else reaps somebody else sows and another person reaps so Paul writes to the 1st Corinthians now the reason he is writing this letter in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 maybe we'll read that 1st Corinthians chapter 3 verses 6 to 9 
think it's 6 to 9. Yes. First Corinthians 3, 6 to 9. Can one of us please read that? I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So the neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. But he who plants and he who waters are none, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Amen. Thank you, John. So, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Now, what's happening in Corinth is these, these people have become believers. They've entered the church. Now, in the church, right? they're saying, hey, I believe in what Apostle Paul told me. I believe in what Apollos told me. Because early in the second missionary journey, uh, Apollos is uh, you know, sent to Corinth to be with the church. So I believe in what Apollos is, is told me. And then later on, some of them say, hey, I believe in what Peter said, Cephas. So you got three people here, and there's division within the church. And Paul is writing to them and saying, hey, somebody sowed the seed in your heart. Apollos maybe watered it. Now, it is not who sowed, it is not who watered, but it is God who makes it grow. So what is Paul trying to say? Hey, there will be times that people will come into our lives and you will be able to minister into people's lives and you may not see the fruit. There have been hundreds of times where I've shared with the gospel with people. I still haven't seen the fruit. But I believe that the seed is sown. Maybe somebody is watering it. At the right time, God will make it grow. Right? Remember that when we are sharing the gospel to people, maybe somebody has already put the seed in their heart. right? Or maybe it's the, you are putting the seed in their heart. right? So, so we don't have to you know, worry about, oh, what if they haven't heard about Jesus at all? right? It's okay. You're putting the seed. Or we don't have to worry about, hey, he already knows about Jesus. No. It's, it's all right. So let me just move on to somebody else. No. If he knows about Jesus, he's still not, he or she is still not believing. God is calling you and I to water it. Right? Uh, to ask those questions, to water that seed so that God can make it grow. There's a part that we must do. I remember reading the story many years back, and that story just stuck with me. And I always uh, you know, read these stories in church history. There was this young man, this happened in early, uh, in the early 1980s, uh, sorry, uh, uh, in the 18, 1800s. Uh, uh, I, I may be wrong with the year, but somewhere in the 1800s, there was a young man named Robert Mary McShane. And he was in England, in Wales, and he was praying for revival. He said he had a small church, about 40, 50 people. And he was praying for revival. He said, God, send revival. He prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. Right? About seven years or nothing happened. The church was still about 50, 70, 100 people. And then he had uh, illnesses, sicknesses in his body. And uh, so he wanted to take a, a sabbatical arrest from preaching and ministry. So they hired a young man named W.C. Burns, only about 24 years old. So W.C. Burns comes into the church. He begins to preach. And all of a sudden, there's a revival. Hundreds of people come into church. And this young man, W.C. Burns, has no idea what is happening. And thousands of people started coming in the revival of Wales. The biggest problem was getting a place to have the church services. So they would have multiple services. You have first service, 2,000 people. Second service, 2,000 people. So the church was packed. And this young man, W.C. Burns, has no idea what's happening. He signed up to pastor a church for 100 people. There are thousands of people. And then people wrote a letter to uh, Robert Murray McShane, who was in his you know, time of rest. And he knew what was happening. He said, Somebody sowed, I watered, and this person, W.C. Burns, 
is reaping what somebody else sowed and maybe somebody else watered. So it is not who sowed, it is not who reaped, but it is God who makes it grow, right? And so when we are sharing, remember that we may be doing one of these two things, either sowing or watering in their lives, right? Another point is connect with them. Jesus engaged with the woman. He started uh, with something that she was doing. And Jesus didn't go to the woman and say, hey, you know who I am? Uh, I'm a Jew, come from, uh, coming from Jerusalem. Uh, can you give me some water? No. Right? What was she doing? She was drinking. She was filling water. Jesus was tired. Jesus was thirsty. All he said was, give me some water. Right? Just a regular connect. Jesus didn't say, oh, you're a Samaritan. Let me go five steps away from you. No. Just acted normal. Just behaved normal. Jesus took that conversation masterfully, stirred that conversation from the regular water to the water of life. What a beautiful way of bringing in the gospel. He says, can I have some water? I'm thirsty. Can I have? Jesus takes that water and drinks from it. And he stills that whole conversation, the point of drinking water. And he connects that whole conversation into something that a water, an eternal water that you will never thirst again. Remember the Samaritan woman may be thinking, where do you get this water where you will never thirst again? I haven't seen it in any of the wells here, nor in Jerusalem, nor any other, nor in Rome. What kind of water is this that if you drink that you can never thirst again? Jesus engaged with people based on what they can relate to, right? Jesus did not say here, this is what the law says. Uh, you know, Moses gave the law and then, uh, you know, uh, we have to do the first sacrifice, the second sacrifice, then there's the Pentecost, then the, these are the first fruits offerings. He didn't give an old explanation of all that because she wouldn't have any idea about all of that. What was, what was, she, what did she know? She knew that, you know, water is needed. She knew that there's a, you know, uh, uh, you know, God knew that, Jesus knew that there was an emptiness inside of her, but he was, Jesus was able to stir that whole conversation to the water of eternal life. Now, even as we talk to people, have conversations with people, ministering to people, evangelizing, maybe sowing the seed or watering the plant, we need to be cautious of certain things, right? Very important. Just because God has called us for ministry, what we, the mistake that we do is we switch off our mind. No, our mind needs to be on. We need to think as we do ministry, right? We need to plan. We need to use our mind. First one, do not engage with people of the opposite sex. You know, don't get emotionally involved. Do not cross moral boundaries, which means there are, you know, there are many pastors that I know of. I leave them unnamed because you may not know them, but young pastors, and they, I have, I, and they call me. They tell me what's happening. They, some of the church students, they say, I want to talk to you. And then this pastor will say, okay, come to church. I'll talk to you. So the pastor comes alone and they have discussions. One hour alone with the girl in the church. Right? One hour alone. Now, what's happening? They, they're having a con Maybe they're having a regular conversation, right? Nothing wrong about it. Maybe they're just uh, truly, uh, you know, having a counseling session and all of that. But all of a sudden, this girl, you know, she had a rough uh, childhood. Her parents, uh, you know, rejected her and all of it. But this girl started liking the pastor. And so it it became very emotional. And even she, he was very emotional with her. And I remember he called me and he said, this is what's happening. I said to him, you need to get out of this immediately. You need to stop counseling her, right? 
just because you you and I uh, you, you're a pastor you you cannot do this and so very important you and I as believers be wise even in the ministry one of the things I praise God I thank God God's grace is even as I started off at a young age I never meet a girl personally people call me old-fashioned when, when, I mean when you know in terms of you know I do talk to uh, our church folks we have a lot of girls who are uh, you know studying here students who come I talk to them when people are around and if they want counseling I take my wife with me uh, and you know most probably I would say you speak to my wife she'll be able to help you and if they say no I want to speak to you I would take my wife along and so we both will sit and speak to her now this is not written in the Bible right but we need the wisdom of God we need to be wise in making decisions. Do not cross moral boundaries, right? In the whole zeal of, oh, I want to share the gospel. I want to be helpful. I want to do everything and help this person and make her or him stand uh, in God's presence and make everything right. In that zeal, we may forget our moral boundaries. Remember that our moral or our personal life is very important for people, even as a testimony. We need to stand as a testimony. Two, do not interfere in personal matters. A big, big drawback in ministry is we've got, you know, uh, ministers and pastors and, uh, and all these so-called prophets and evangelists who come up and say, you know, I met this lady who stays a little away from the city and she said, uh, you know, this pastor that I, the church that I go to, uh, this pastor said, uh, you know, if, if I don't give to God, God will not bless me. So he said, sell half your land and give it to God. And and she was just, uh, you know, uh, didn't know what to do. She sold half the land, gave it to God. And then she expected God to bless her. And everything was okay until her husband came and she told her husband, I sold half an acre of land and there was a complete disaster. Uh, uh, and, you know, the pastor was involved, the family was involved. Never interfere into personal matters as leaders. Right? We'll talk about a little bit of leadership and discipleship later on of this in this course. But as leaders, always give suggestions. Give them ideas. Give them your thoughts. Give them biblical, uh, you know, solutions to their problems. Give them biblical uh, strategies, but do not make decisions for them. People are grown up, they're above 17 or above 18, they're grown up, they can make their own decisions, right? So we need to stay away from that, right? Do not be condemning, do not be condescending or self-righteous, right? Don't condemn another religion, don't uh, mock their religion, you know, oh, that's only made of wood, that's only made of stone, don't do that, right? And don't have that self-righteous attitude like, you know, I have, I know everything. I am, you know, uh, the whole thing of being, knowing, you know, I am the holy of ho uh, holiest than everyone else. And you know, we need to come out of all of those things. Just be normal. Jesus here, he didn't say, oh, Samaritan woman, go away from me for I am the Messiah. He didn't do all of that. He just behave normal, right? Third one. There was an impact in that conversation. As Jesus engaged with the woman, he released word of knowledge. Uh, sorry, the word of knowledge. He he was able to say something of his of her past and also something uh, uh, of her present. Right? You had five husbands, and the one that you're living with now is not even your husband. So you got your past and you got your present. This affected her powerfully. Who is this random man? who came, who asked for water, and is he knows everything about my life, right? Uh, she began to ask him questions, and that day she accepted Jesus, and she believed in Jesus. Here's, here's a wonderful thing that we can learn from this. You know, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is poured out on all the believers as they were praying. You and I have the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit comes with his gifts. So you and I can ask God to release the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit 
while we are ministering to people. Right? Remember, we're not going alone. Right? Even if we are sharing the gospel with people, remember God is able to release the supernatural. God is able to bring healing upon people. God is able to work miracles. Right? He's able to do that. If somebody comes, uh, you know, for example, a friend of yours uh, says, hey, you know what, I've been having this terrible back pain from working from home for the past six months. What is the first thing you're going to do? Now, the first thing you do is don't say, okay, why don't you go meet this doctor? This is a good doctor. My parents go, no, don't do that. First, pray. Say, hey, you know what Jesus did? Even I was going through this pain. Jesus healed me. Can I pray for you? They go, most probably they'll say yes because they want to get rid of the pain. Pray for them. Expect God to bring healing. Expect the Holy Spirit to work in his life. God is able to do it. Right? Expect miracles. Take simple steps and ask God to release the supernatural. Right Now, this could be a prophetic word, a word of knowledge, working of miracles. Now, how do I know that God is the Holy Spirit will do this? Here comes the part of spending time in prayer, spending time reading the word of God, without which we will not be empowered by the Holy Spirit. As we mentioned in, or in, the, in the first few classes, if we want to evangelize, if we want to reach out to people, we need to do it through the anointing and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Right? Yes, we use our natural abilities also on the way we talk, the skill of talking and asking questions, but we need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit in power. Right? And then when we are anointed, God. Now, some of them may ask, okay, I'm anointed by the Holy Spirit, but this person is not accepting Jesus. It's been six months. That's all right. Continue to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things about him, to give me a, give you a prophetic word. Right? Continue. The more we pray, the more we ask God, the more we uh, have this in-depth relationship with God, God will begin to release the supernatural in our lives. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, there are times, there's this one time I went to the hospital to pray for somebody and uh, I was in fasting and prayer and all of it. I went to pray and uh, uh, I laid my hands on this woman. I said, I did a strong prayer. Right through three, four minutes, the name of Jesus and all of that. And then after uh, the prayer, I asked her, how do you feel now? Uh, she said, worse than before. Uh, I was just taken aback. <laughs> said, uh, it's, the pain is increasing even more. I said, oh God, what is this? Did I... It's all right. There are times we I've prayed for people who are on the sick bed. They've got up and walked. Right? And there are times that it's not happened. So does not mean that we are not empowered. You, we continue to ask God. Continue to ask God for working of miracles, working of anointing, working of the anointing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? As we evangelize. Remember this, uh, you know, something that we always focus on in APC is our personal life, our, our personal walk with God will reflect in our public ministry. Our personal walk with God would reflect in our public ministry. So the more we spend time with God, the more we will see a fruitful ministry. The more we are surrendered, submitted, obedient to God, the more we will see a fruitful ministry. Right? Just the last point, fourth one, there was a ripple effect. What started with one Samaritan woman, what did she say? I'm going to go, I'm going to tell people. And the other people also began to accept. You know, the Bible does not say that the entire city, everyone accepted. Right? Most of them did. But there would have been people who would not have accepted this. No, I don't believe in this. Right? That's all right. But many people accepted it. Right? So when you and I share the gospel with one person, or you're reviving some person back to the Lord, there can be a ripple effect where the entire family or their entire friend circle or the workplace friends, everyone will get to see the fruit in your life and they will also be willing to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Right. So let's close with today. Anybody have any questions, any thoughts that you would like to share? Any one of us? So, uh, so we will close today. Uh, as usual, I want to encourage you to try and, you know, maybe even if it's through the phone, sending a message or sending a video to somebody you know, go ahead and do that and uh, try to uh, share the gospel with people. I hope you've been able to take uh, pointers from this. Uh, what we will also do is from next week, uh, we'll do a couple of role plays uh, with a few scenarios with some of us. We'll see how that works. Um, and then we can pick up from the next chapter as well. All right, let's close in prayer. Can one of us please close? Uh, Rosalind, can you please close in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful session. Lord, whatever we learned in your presence, God Almighty, help us, give us the grace that we may apply those things in our life, that we may minister to people, Lord, whomever you bring across us, Lord. Father God, may we not be lazy in doing this, Father God. Give us the grace, give us the strength, Lord, whatever we learn here in this session that we may put it in practice without fearing with your boldness thank you lord for doing it in jesus name we pray amen amen amen, amen. thank you rosalind thank you everyone for joining us uh, have a great week ahead i'll see you next week god bless thank you sir thank you, thank you.